Hello and welcome to um, Chemistry Paper 1. This is uh, the Ed Excel uh, 2018 series. So let's look at the front of the paper to start off with. So it's paper one of two papers and it's higher tier and it's one hour 45 minutes long. So in the actual exam, be one hour 45 minutes. So it's a little bit of a longer one um, than you might be used to. So in the real exam, you need to write in black or ballpoint pen. That's because they scan the paper. So it has to be in dark ink. It scans, it's sent off for marking. So I've marked papers before and it's appearing on your screen when you mark it. Okay. Um, which you make sure your writing's clear, as we'll talk about as I go through. It doesn't have to be the best, most beautiful handwriting in the world, uh, just so people can read it. So when they mark it, it'll be easier to read. Um, so this paper is a hundred, uh, yep, so to mark the paper is a hundred, that's nice and easy to think about. Um, the marks for each question, it says shown in brackets, and I'll talk about that as I go through, about what you need to write for each one, and I'll write them out as we go along here, so you'll see me do it live. Um, also said advice, which is good advice, read each question carefully before you start to answer it. So I'm not going to rush anything here, I'm going to read through it carefully and it says try to answer every question so even if you don't know try to guess they don't take marks for things that are wrong they only give you marks for things that are right because oh yeah i've marked papers as an examiner if there's a blank question obviously you can't get any marks but if even if you may have shown some sort of working or drawn a diagram you can still get marks for that Okay, so always just try, even if you think you don't know it, just have a go. Okay, so let's look at the first question then. Yep, answer all questions. Write your answers in the spaces provided. Um, the reason why it says do not write in this area is because, yeah, it gets scanned by a computer. It doesn't scan those edges. The things that you write here will be cut off by the computer. Okay, so let's all, if you need a bit more space, um, you can usually write a little bit underneath, writing down here will be okay. Okay, but just not on this edge. It still scans that bit, but try to keep it in the um, in the lines. But if you need a little bit of space down there, that's okay. Okay, let's start reading the first question. Number one, alloy steels are made when iron is alloyed with another transmission transition, sorry, metal, such as cobalt and chromium. Which row of the table shows the typical properties of a transition metal? So if you remember, okay, a transition metal, let's go to the back of the paper for a moment just to show. Um, there's a periodic table. So at the back of your paper, the last page, is a periodic table. Okay, so um, I'm just going to flip this round to show us. Um, so at the back, yeah, so the back is a periodic table. So you don't have to remember the numbers. Okay. So the transition metals are the ones in this block here. Okay, the middle block, the transition metals. Okay, so you've got group one, two, and it sort of skips, doesn't it? Three, four, five, six, seven. And sometimes it's called eight, sometimes it's called zero. It's the same group. Okay, the transition metals are in the middle. Okay, transition metals. They haven't got a group, they're just called the transition metals. We've got iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, there's lots of other ones as well. Okay, and they all have commonalities with, with, with each other. They're all very strong. Okay, they've got high melting points. They make coloured compounds. So things, actually, um, I'm filming this in a bonfire night, funnily enough. Um, we're on fire night, obviously, you have fireworks with different colours. And the colours from the, uh, the fireworks actually come from transition metals. So, for example, copper would form a green compound. Okay. Um, you'd get um, the one like chromium forming other colours. Nickel forms lovely green. Uh, cobalt forms blue. Okay, that's a good thing to know about transition metals. Let's go back to the question, put that into context. <laughs> I need to flip back around, don't I? Right, let's go back. Right, here we go. Which row of the table shows the typical properties of a transition metal? So used as a catalyst. Okay, that's interesting because that will come in later when we talk about industrial processes. 
Transition metals are often used as catalysts. If you might remember, in the making of ammonia, we use an iron catalyst. Okay, and that's a transition metal. So you might not have thought about that immediately, but they are used as catalysts. So yes, density. Okay, so if you pick it up, does it feel heavy? We think metals, you think, well, yes, so I think about iron, pick up a piece of iron, or if you have steel, think about cutlery, which is made of steel, uh, that's made of transition metals. It's quite dense, isn't it? In fact, it's quite heavy, really, isn't it, to pick up? So it's got a high density. So yes, and a high density, okay, colour of metal chloride. So we talked about the transition metals, and they can form coloured compounds. They form coloured chlorides, uh, coloured um, iodides. So yeah, remember nickel chloride, I always remember seeing it. Uh, I used to work um, in the science laboratory, uh, seeing nickel chloride in the chemical store. It's a beautiful light green colour. Okay, so have a look at some nickel, some metal chloride, especially nickel chloride, look that up. And you'll definitely remember it's a coloured compound, a very beautiful um, compound. So I think they, they used uh, copper as a green, a beautiful green colour. Okay, uh, so which one is correct? So use catalyst, yes. Density high, colour of metal chloride. So careful with this wording because it's this coloured or colourless. It's coloured. So they have colours green, blues, some of red. And think about iron, think about rust. Okay, oh, need to turn my pen tool on. I uh, think about rust, it's like an orangey red colour. That's, a, that's a, a compound of iron, that's iron oxide. So that's got a colour to it. Okay. Figure one shows the chain on a bicycle. So it's this chain bit here. Explain how lubricating the chain with oil prevents corrosion of the steel chain. So remember, uh, steel's got iron in it. Iron corrodes. It reacts with the oxygen in the air. So let's just write that down. So um, let's write this. How, that's how we're going to start this. Okay. So the Corrosion occurs, let's explain how it occurs. So corrosion, two marks, so a little bit more detail, more than, more than one sentence. Corrosion occurs okay, when the metal is exposed. So this is a key point about why you put, um, you duplicate your chain, is exposed to the air and water. Okay. Okay, so um, we say loop case, so you're covering the chain in oil. So you're covering it in oil. So covering the chain in oil. In oil. Acts as a barrier to the air and water, okay? If you, yeah, the, um, it's also the case for motorbike chain. I've got a few motorbikes. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I forgot to maintain the chain. It's actually very dangerous because the chain can break. And also, if you're on a motorbike or a bike, you go through water, um, so a, a flood or a puddle, you have to make sure you clean the chain afterwards, make sure it's dry as well. Otherwise, yeah, that can corrode the chain. And that's actually quite a dangerous thing. You lose control if your chain breaks, okay, or it all gets jammed. So that's a very important thing here, okay, is to stop the chain corroding. That weakens the chain, okay? So that's the important thing. Safety advice through this video too. Um, you know, science, this is why I enjoy science so much. It's obviously useful information for, for real uh, life too. Okay, it's a bit more about corrosion, iron. Iron fences can be galvanized, that's a good word, isn't it? By coating them with a layer of zinc. Okay, layer of zinc. When the layer of zinc is scratched, exposing the iron to the weather, the iron does not rust. Explain why the exposed iron does not rust. Ah, okay, so the, also the zinc part is the important bit. Zinc is actually quite reactive. Okay, so zinc, let's write that down. So zinc 
is more reactive than iron. So zinc is more reactive than iron. So what happens is actually what's known as a sacrificial metal. Okay, so the zinc will uh, corrode instead of the iron. So what is happening there is that the zinc is reacting with the air and the water instead of the iron. So it's called, uh, this is known as a little bit of extra. This is known as a sacrificial metal. Sacrificial metal. Okay, sacrificial metal. So you can think of that. Um, in the ancient times, people um, from different, uh, different cultures around the world, they used to uh, sacrifice animals. They used to think that made the um, sort of like um, their sort of better fortune for the humans. You think if I killed the animal, I thought that the um, sort of whatever they believed in would help them with their their crops and things. So sacrificial means you're um, killing or destroying something else to save something else. The word sacrifice. Okay. Okay. Sometimes it's uh, you can say, oh, because that, yeah, I will sacrifice something. Okay. It means that I'll destroy one thing to save something else. In this case, it's uh, not quite as um, dramatic. All you're doing is that the zinc will corrode okay, before the iron. But of course, this won't, um, the one layer of zinc won't last forever. So the zinc layer will have to be replaced over time. It has to be regalvanized over time, okay, to so stop the iron uh, rusting. Okay, so remember, zinc is more reactive than iron. You could use it, anything more reactive than iron would do this. It doesn't have to just be zinc. You could have other metals that are more reactive than iron to do this, okay? But that's a good explanation for um, two points. Also, there's another thing about um, if he, it says the word, because the only metal that rusts, it's got the special word rust, is iron. You have to say zinc corrodes, it doesn't rust. It's just a, a funny lang English language thing is that we have only iron rusts and all other um, metals uh, are said to corrode. Even though it's the same reaction with the air and water, they're said to corrode and iron is said to rust. Okay, so corrode is the main term for that. So always make sure you said the word corrode there, because in the mark scheme, it doesn't they have it? Doesn't they only mark the same zinc rusts? I don't know. So a little bit, a um, little bit harsh that was, um, but I'm just saying now to avoid that. Okay, now the next one anyway. Number number two. Uh, metals have higher melting points. Explain in terms of their structure and bonding why metals have higher melting points. Okay. So let's think about what the structure of metal is like. So metals, okay, metals, okay, are made from positive ions, okay, ions, okay, ions, surrounded by delocalized electrons. Okay, this is called metallic bonding. Delocalized. That means they're free to move around. Delocalized electrons. So they are free to move around. Okay, so there are strong forces of attraction, okay, between metal ions. So strong bonding or forces of attraction, so strong bonds between the metal ions. Okay, so that need a lot of energy 
to break them apart that require, so use a bit of a fancier word, require, I think need would be okay too, or use a fancier one, that require, so that are, um, a lot of energy to break them apart. Okay, so that's our, that's our, our marks there. So let's have, let's go on to the next question. So let's see how long it is. So I didn't have to split this video up. So what I'll do then um, is that I actually stop the video there and I'll film the next part. So I split this into a few parts of this video um, with this paper. So I'm gonna stop that there and I'll see you in the next part. But thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next part. Goodbye.